Hi, everybody, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. My name is Coco McClicky Lots. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you doing tonight, Coco? Um, I'm actually doing okay uh, because I'm no longer hungover from my birthday being yes. two days ago. Yes, yes, it was Coco's birthday. Mm-hmm. She is in her mid 30s and flirty and thriving. Oh my god, I could be technically considered mid 30s. That's uncomfortable as shit. Early mid 30s, but mid 30s, yeah. I love how we're going to keep I'm going to be 39 one day. You know, it's like early mid kind of late 30s. <laughs> <laughs> we're just trying to justify it to make us all seem a bit younger. Like I say nowadays, I I age myself though. I go, I'm damn near 30. Because I'm I'm technically less than two years away from thirty. Yes, me and Donna are in different Year spheres of life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what those spheres are. Oh goodness. Um. Oh yeah. We're so, still part of the same generation, though, right? Yeah, we're both millennials. Yeah, we are. Oh yeah. So what's what are the generations that come after us? So there's uh, Gen Z. Gen or, Z. I I don't know if Gen Z is the same as Zoomers. Maybe Zoomers are younger than Gen Z, but I know Gen Z. They're there's some wild, wild, crazy little little people. They're the they're the type that, you know, they were part of the Tide Pod craze. And they also um, <laughs> I, I saw a really nice meme about Gen Z that says Gen Z is too afraid to ask their waiter for ketchup, but will body slam a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. It's true. I've Shit. seen I've seen the way that some of these kids act. I'm like, damn, I'm like, OK, they, they are fearless. These Gen Zers, like, they don't give a shit. But this, that is the truest analogy I have ever heard in my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask their waiter for ketchup. <laughs> oh, man. I just, sorry, I'm broken. Followers <laughs> slash listeners. And I broken. saw a Gen Z response to that said, uh, that said, that's because we respect people who actually serve. <laughs> So, that was oh, damn. that was the response. Woo. <laughs> damn, that is some strong tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Damn. But yeah, no. So that's kind of that's kind of the the how the generations go, and that's also the intro to our episode. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. This is, our tangents are getting better. They are. <laughs> I'm a little giggly. I don't know what happened. Oh, I, <laughs> I think I it was know. just really funny. <laughs> Honestly, that was absolutely hysterical. <laughs> it's great. I've been, uh, you know what? Gen Z's got me hooked on TikTok, and I'm I'm in, <laughs> I'm in love with them. <laughs> they are they are. So so fearless and i'm just like okay go get it gen z you know what i'll be the millennial that you're just having to coach on throughout this revolution oh my god i've been so coached (laughs) i download those stupid tiktok how-to videos right because i need to know later because i'm too old to remember in the moment (laughs) (laughs) oh goodness yeah yeah so well we have some not funny topics (laughs) we don't there's no way to like (laughs) have a funny transition into our heavy topics that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, so actually, we actually let's go from the positive to the negative. So, like um, like I said before, it was my birthday yesterday, mm-hmm. um, and we decided to do this really dangerous thing, and I know it's probably wrong, listeners, but I'm going to admit it to you now. Um, me and Donna uh, went out in public yes. um, <laughs> during COVID. Yes. Um, we performed in a drag show, um, mm-hmm. a social distancing drag show. So we do live in Portland, remember? And they are really focused on that. So we weren't being unsafe. Listeners, we wore masks. Mm-hmm. We followed all the rules. And we also uh, went to a bar after. Mm-hmm. So um, the drag show itself specifically, and we wanted to talk about this because, you know, being out in public and this is a drag related podcast. Um uh, there were a lot of rules. There were, yeah. I mean, and that's to be expected because they have to comply with laws and regulations now. Mm-hmm. Um, because this, you know, this whole pandemic is something that a lot of people say, well, we didn't see this coming. Well, you know, Obama had a whole playbook on it, but, you mm-hmm. know, our lovely commander in chief threw that out. So. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're just kind of dealing with things on a whim as they happen, oh, and uh, we're going to all be experiencing a lot of new experiences. You, and d- you literally just made our country sound like somebody who doesn't know if they need to go to college. I mean, <laughs> I mean. Our country's taking a gap year. <laughs> Basically. 
Basically. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that are happening that are new experiences for us all. Um, it did feel a little bit weird. I, I didn't feel super right, really, about being out. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it does feel like, you know, there's no safe way to do this right now. I feel like reopening happened very soon. There were a lot of people that just weren't obeying protocols. And it's like, I feel like to a certain extent, people have gotten comfortable with the fact that like it's just gonna happen like and that's terrible right that like these these rise in cases and deaths are just gonna happen and it's inevitable and i've even seen people talk about like scientific theories of like certain countries that didn't do like the closures and and quarantine you know like some european countries and stuff and how we just need to like you know just let this virus virus take its course you know and that's we don't we still don't know what the right answers are we none of us do none of us knows what the right answers are right now yeah as when this episode airs it would have been if everyone would have complied to isolate and stay yeah stay home yes but that hasn't happened no and and we're part of it this is what's (laughs) this is what struggles well actually the funny thing is we offered something to people to where they could do in their home so i feel like Mm -hmm. we did the country a service but seriously like it's super super crazy that we just lived in this society like this capitalist society that the fact of the matter is like we struggle so much with trying to figure out how to put food on our table or a roof over our head that at the end of the day like we didn't really protect ourselves from COVID, Mm -hmm. or we don't want to or were we reopening too quickly because of it yeah i mean you've had to go to work every day in a crowded building yeah i went to work every i I don't feel, I didn't social distance on the work level. Yeah, yeah. So I had the option of staying at home. So I, luckily, my exposure has been extremely limited um, throughout the entire course of this quarantine because I have been at home by myself for Mm -hmm. a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, like, there's people who have had to work and had to be up and around and exposing themselves constantly because of the society we live in. Yeah, yeah. Because we couldn't give... The, the biggest break we could give our people was... Some of our people was in the form of a $1,200 stimulus check. You know, and that's what's really shitty about this situation is the fact that uh, other countries had a bigger stimulus from what mm-hmm. we've heard. And more often. More often. Not just one. The definite more often. Because that mm-hmm. wouldn't have been such a big deal if, um, you know, unemployment and the stimulus mm-hmm. check... Uh, a monthly stimulus stimulus check that would have really helped us out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Gosh, but it was so crazy though. So we're in a hot basement of a bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the whole time we weren't. One of the rules were we weren't allowed to go back upstairs, so we mm-hmm. just stay down we had to there. Stay down downstairs, Whew. and then we stayed in our own little corner of the, of the basement that was like far from really any other people. Um, until we had to like walk up to get on stage and that was it. And there was also mm-hmm. like precautions that people had to put tips into a fishbowl. Um, you couldn't t- like the performer couldn't like take to obviously couldn't take tips from people. So that was, you know, like that was one of the precautions. Um, what else was it? You kind of had to, there was like a certain area that you were like as. Yeah. Like, well, oh, so like, in. yeah. So even when you entered the stage, you were supposed to enter from the left and come back on the right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was kind of awkward and new. And then you could only have, like, one person, like, on the platform ready to go before, while the person was performing. Like, it was a whole mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. You know, um, the one thing that even kills me about that situation was I wanted to do this for my birthday because I miss me and my girls being in drag. Yeah. Um, you know, going out and having a good time. But honestly, it just changed the whole dynamic of the evening. It changed the whole world a little bit. Yeah. Like me and Donatella have been working really hard not to like break quarantine and stay inside so like being out in public and like seeing and doing these things was kind of crazy mm-hmm. and like wanting really understanding that we really sh- it it kind of made me feel bad a little bit I mm-hmm. guess because I really wanted to be able to be out and have what it was but it's not that anymore yeah it's just not yeah yeah it's not it's not. So we did go to uh, the bar next door as mm-hmm. well. And um, that experience, there were signs everywhere. Yeah. Gosh, and so many rules. So, so many rules. Yeah, couldn't have your mask off unless you were um, seated. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was. It, I feel like it was kind of something to be expected that there would be all of that mm-hmm. in place. But um, yeah, I don't know. It was. It was just a very different experience. It was fun to be with friends, but it was also. Mm-hmm. It was just. It wasn't the same. Yeah. 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 I forgot to ask, Donna, how are you doing this evening? I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Have you ever been drunk off your ass at a gay bar during a drag show and thought, You know what? I can do that. <laughs> Maybe if I control the yellow shots, I can have more for myself. Then have we got a show for you. Cooking Up a Queen. A brand new limited series brought to you by the CD Studios. Over the course of a 10-week run, you'll be brought into the flagrant and fanciful world of queer nightlife. With Camp One Kiki finalist Coco Jim Holiday and rising star of the Portland drag scene Touche Douche. These two will delve deep into what it takes to be a drag entertainer, the do's and don'ts of newcomers on the scene, as well as discuss topics that you would never think would come up until you're a cross-dresser on the corner of 5th and Broadway. Trust me, you're going to want to pay special attention for that one because, um, it's a lot. Make sure to tune in starting May 31st every Sunday for Cooking Up a Queen, available wherever you podcast. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. You know what, Coco? I am doing pretty great. I uh, I took an edible. <laughs> I have a case of the giggles, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> I feel like she's trying to shame me for some reason that I would never admit to my mother. <laughs> yeah, she would never do that. Um, so we yeah. wanted to talk about. So we wanted to talk about the bar owner situation, and we wanted to talk about how um, we know that. Like, so coming off of like talking about how bars are open, and whatever. But in Portland specifically, there has been this like dynamic of people wanting to hold bars and venues accountable for some of the na- negative actions they may have had. Yeah, definitely. And it's come um, in the form of a lot of Facebook statuses and a lot of posts um, and basically some verbal like sparring matches between entertainers and between um, bar owners, um, specifically black entertainers and uh, other POC entertainers. Yeah, so one of the places we were talking about in the podcast tonight is a place called Stag here mm-hmm. in Portland, Portland downtown. Um, their uh, bar owner has done some things that have been incredibly problematic and, of course, racist and some transphobic, a bunch of different things. Yeah, honestly, it's just a slew of problematic behavior that this person has been called out for. Yeah, and so... I don't necessarily want to focus on that specific piece of it, too, because, like, that's in the Internet. You guys can find that. But um, we I wanted to talk about, like, we as drag entertainers, like, we want to get that money. We want to perform in these places or whatever. But we sometimes we have to sell out our soul because we want to be able to have the bookings and have a job and be able to move forward in that capacity. Mm -hmm. And that gets really challenging when we have to work at places that sometimes don't fit with our moral code. Yeah, definitely. Have you ever felt like you've had to risk some of that working with anybody? Yeah, I have, actually. Most of my drag career, I've been working with people that um, sometimes I have to risk my morality to, you know, work for. And Mm -hmm. from show producers to, of course, bar owners to hosts and things like that, it's there's a slew of people that, you know, have made me feel a certain way about that stuff. And how did you feel like you had to navigate your morals basically in that situation? Or was it because you were just trying to make it by like that's, it was the option you had to take pretty much. I basically told myself that, that at the end of the day, I needed the booking to be able to be known. So I justified it because I was growing but nowadays I'm not growing and I'm not quite sure how I feel. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's obviously not a decision that I could feel like I could be up on the moral high ground saying like, oh, I would never, you know, work for someone that said after like all this came out and especially during this time, I could never do that. I do, however, though, feel like as queer entertainers, it is our responsibility to stand up and to... um 
call out said behavior or to try and improve it. Anything that we can to make it better. You know, whether that's diversity trainings for staff at some of these establishments, whether that's, you know, doing something that can make significant difference um, in the way that entertainers and uh, just, uh, you know, people who go into those venues are treated, especially if they're um, of color. Yeah. And because even even in this community, um, we're also kind of feeling a little bit powerless Mm -hmm. to actually make some of those changes because it's like asking black people to lose their livelihood for mm-hmm. a cause. And that's really, sh- that's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I don't know. It's, it is a difficult situation to navigate, but I also just feel like, um, yeah, Queens and, uh, queers have always been the ones to make change happen and get that mom- momentum up for that. So I feel like if anyone can make a difference, it's our own community that that can when it comes to changing behaviors and stuff. Yeah, and hopefully we continue speaking out to hopefully make a difference too. For real. Um, so in Portland, there's been a lot of BLM movements and BLM protests and demonstrations um, out there, but it did not, um, it didn't go unnoticed even with like the queer community because black queer people in Portland specifically have been speaking up and mm-hmm. actually trying to make a difference, which is really cool and awesome to see. But it has also led us to like this conversation of blackness and transphobia in our communities, uh, specifically because it there was a lot of intersecting ideas that were happening. Mm-hmm. And um, some trans people in the greater Portland area have been, f- who've felt like their issues have been shot down. Mm. Was there a lot of, like, overlap in identity on that discussion? Were there, like, was there a lot of intersectionality of identity? Being, like, trans and a person of color? Or um, was it mostly... Not, yeah, there wasn't a lot of people who were both. It was usually race, again, it was race against gender, honestly. Mm. And it was really uncomfortable to see a little bit. Like, it was one of those things that made me not know how to approach it because I, I have those intersecting identities because being by gender and black. Yeah, yeah. Um, what were some of the biggest issues, I guess, that were raised during that thread? It seemed like black women specifically uh, don't like the term cisgender on this status. And mm-hmm. um, Donna, what is cisgender for our listeners? Cisgender is someone who identifies or uh, with the sex that they were born. Um, so if they identify with their sex as their gender identity, then they are cisgender, um, or that they're assigned, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of what it was about. And then it led to this discussion of should black women have a more powerful voice in that conversation? And that's, I think where the disconnect was happening. Mm -hmm. It was more so like cisgender was another label built to oppress women of color. Mm. Hmm. And do you feel that that that's necessarily accurate? I don't know. Like after after hearing everything, I just don't know actually where we sat. But mm. I think it was kind of interesting to have the conversation just kind of to begin with, because it let kind of everyone be heard. Mm-hmm. But in having those dialogues, it was also silencing to the trans community who are working on some like stronger issues right now than mm-hmm. these kinds these ones. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's just a really difficult subject to honestly try to find something to say about because you don't want to be offensive to either side. No, so, I don't want to disregard any feelings on either side. Yeah, definitely. So, so it, and I think that it's important to acknowledge, though, that both identities have their own sets of struggles and um, are oppressed in different ways. Yes, and... Honestly, playing the oppression Olympics isn't going to really do anything for us right now. No. But so just be respectful of each other and listen to each other. That's so important. That's, I mean, along the lines with unity and what I was saying is right now we are a lot stronger as a whole than we are separated. It really does feel like the powers that be, the people that are in in control right now, want to see us fighting one another, want to see us disagreeing because we're weaker that way. But when we can come together, and especially when, you know, we're bo- we're all part of mar- these marginalized communities in some way, shape, or form, especially right. if you identify in queer spaces or, you know, um, or whether you're a person of color, you know, we're, our, we're all dealing with um, these, these issues. 
um, where we're marginalized in some way, shape, or form. So I think by having some compassion for everyone who experiences that, we can relate it back to ourselves and um, realize that we're stronger as one. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of our episode. So it's time for our Feed the Positive segment. Um, My first one is going to be Kimberly Michelle Westwood. Hashtag Kimberly Westwood on Instagram. They recently came out about speaking out against some controversy and it made them look so absolutely fantastic on the internet, but also just because they've been a really cool entertainer in the city. Great makeup, great costume. Seriously, I just adore Kimberly, and so that's why she's my Feed the Positive. Yeah, Kim's absolutely great, and she just turns out some very, very stunning looks. Um, I'm going to give a shout-out to one of Portland's sweethearts, Miss Shima B. Valentine, I believe is her full name. Yeah. And you can find her on Instagram at Shima underscore Valentine. Uh, she was someone that as soon as I hit the scene, I really thought she was uh, a cool person to be around. Um, she thought that I was mean and scary because of my brows. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I pr- proved that that wasn't the case with her. And um, actually, I, I really enjoy... Um, seeing Shima out and about and just uh, getting to know her more in the scene because she's someone that I feel like um, is just uh, a good soul and someone that uh, brings uh, a good energy to the scene here in Portland along with Kim. Yeah, definitely. So that brings us to the end of our episode, everybody. Uh, my name is Coco Gem Holiday. And my name is Donatella My Secrets. Please sure to rate us on Apple iTunes if you get the chance. <laughs> what was that? Get that chance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, rate, subscribe on whatever platform you listen on, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of HM of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>